Well, thank you very much. Well, what an honor to be here. It's an incredibly beautiful event and such amazing speakers to follow, uh, incredible cello. And the things we've been hearing about are things that really would have been impossible 10 years ago, the precision medicine, stem cell research, the way we're monitoring every motion of a surgeon. And Stanford really is taking on the impossible and bringing things to a new level. And what I'm going to talk to you about is how we're also at Stanford moving towards the impossible task of overcoming all needless blindness on Earth. Half of all blindness on our planet could easily be treated and restored to perfect sight. There are 18 million people blind from treatable cataracts that we can restore perfect sight to for $50. So why do you have a picture of a mountain behind us? Well, I was always kind of an uh, outdoor kid. I ski raced, rock climbed as a kid, became a fairly fanatical rock climber. And this is a picture of Mount Everest. And when I was um, in medical school in 1983, I got invited to go on a trip to try the first ascent of the last unclimbed face on Everest. Everest is a three-sided pyramid, and you always see pictures of previous one was from the north, and the south coal route is the one you always hear about. But the eastern side is the largest and steepest face on Everest. It was really considered absolutely impossible. It is a 5,000-foot buttress at the bottom that is technical climbing, similar to climbing El Capitan, but at altitude. And in 1983, people had never really attempted anything at that level. So how do you take on impossible? Well, first you have to have the background, the training, you have to have a great team. And we weren't necessarily the best nine climbers in America in 1983, but we were an amazing team. And we all believed that we could take on the impossible. And you start with the first step. And we were able to make the first ascent to the east face of Mount Everest. Our route still has never been repeated. And it's also the only new route accomplished on Mount Everest without any Sherpa support whatsoever. And that, no, 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 that, that, that was long ago. But, you know, it, it was something that really sort of opened my mind to the possibility of taking on really huge challenges. And it also, traveling to climb, climbing in Asia, climbing in Africa, really opened my mind to the disparity between access and quality of health care to the haves and half-nots of our world. I also had the good fortune to meet Sir Edmund Hillary, who became a good friend. And he was one of my heroes, not just for his climbing accomplishments, which are really myriad beyond Everest, but also for what he gave back to the people of Nepal. He built hospitals, he built schools. And I worked as a doctor at the Hillary Hospital in Faplu, Nepal, which it just so happens in two weeks, I'll be back doing cataract surgery at the Hillary Hospital in Faplu, Nepal. But my experience working there was really in some ways incredibly exciting, but also very frustrating. Because I had children die of things that would be so easy to care for in the West. I had children dying from diarrhea, from pneumonia. I had women who died with me in childbirth. And I was just on the cusp of returning to the States to pursue a PhD in public health when I saw the miracle of cataract surgery. Now, in America, cataract surgery is not a big deal. I'm sure there are a lot of people in the audience who've had cataract surgery. Modestly, it's something we do fantastically at Stanford. Our cataract surgeons are all amazing at Stanford. And it's just, you get a little bit blurry vision. Oh, it's a cataract, you get it fixed. And in America, we have one eye surgeon for every 18,000 people. But in Nepal, it was just accepted that you get old, your hair turns white, your eye turns white, and then you die. And this is what a mature cataract looks like. And a person with a cataract like this would only see the shadow of light and dark. They couldn't see the motion of a hand move in front of their face. People got depressed, shriveled, and waiting to die. And the life expectancy, once you go blind from a cataract like this, is one-third that of age and health match peers. And one of my really darling patients, Patali Garung, I thought she was in her 70s. She was all shriveled, depressed, waiting to die. And an Nepali term for a blind person is a mouth with no hands. 
And when you're in a subsistence agrarian economy, a mouth with no hands is a huge burden, not just on the individual, but on their whole family. It takes a person out of the workforce, often a child out of school. This is a child who will never get an education because he has to take care of his blind father. And I watched a Dutch team come in and they did cataract surgery. And Patali Garung just blossomed back to life. It was the craziest miracle I'd ever seen. About 30 people in our village went from total blindness to perfect sight. And I went, wow, I've never seen a miracle like this in Western medicine. And I came to Kathmandu and I saw that in 1989 there was no one in the whole country of Nepal doing modern cataract surgery with lens implants. So I came back to the States, I pursued a residency in ophthalmology, I did a fellowship in advanced cataract surgery and corneal transplant surgery. And what I didn't realize was that my partner, my elder brother, and really the genius behind anything I've been able to accomplish, this man here, Sandik Ruit, who has an adjunct professorship here at Stanford. And Sandik grew up in a hill village, three days walk from the nearest road. No electricity, no running water, no schools. And at the age of 10, he began his schooling at 17, he earned a scholarship to one of the best medical schools in India. He scored number one on the Indian medical exams, trained at the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi, then did a fellowship with the same doctor I watched in the Netherlands, and then a two-year fellowship in Australia. And he came back to Nepal to start our program the year I started my residency in the States. And here in America, a lot of the best minds you've been hearing some incredible things are going on in oncology and things going on in all different fields. We're kind of looking at how can we make our care 1% better for our patients, even if it's 100% more expensive. Well, Dr. Rui and I started thinking about how can we provide 100% the same quality care that a cost that's affordable to the poorest of the poor in Nepal. One of the first things was figuring out how to utilize the resources. In America, when we take the cataract out, we put a little lens implant in that allows perfect focus. Well, at the time, in 1990, the least expensive lens implant on the world market was $300. That made it absolutely prohibitive to the poorest countries of the world. So we began manufacturing lens implants in Nepal and with locally sourced materials, local manufacturing, local pharmaceuticals, we were able to bring the cost down to under $50 per surgery. And we began thinking out how can we reach the poorest of the poor. We began training at all levels and figuring out ways that a patient like this who lives days from the nearest facility can be carried to a place where they can get care. The numbers are daunting. There are 18 million people still blind with cataracts. But this is a woman who will no longer be a statistic. She will be 100% cured. That's one of the cool things about cataract surgery is that it's a 100% cure. And we began really trying to figure out how to develop a system of eye care, training some of our best young doctors to do cataract surgery, then taking some of our best young cataract surgeons, training them to do subspecialties, retinal surgery, glaucoma, corneal transplantation, pediatric ophthalmology. And we started a full world-class residency in Nepal, but we also trained at all levels, training ophthalmic nurses, ophthalmic technicians in a three-year program after high school, ophthalmic assistants in a six-month program after eighth grade. And Nepal went from having 15,000 cataracts done a year in 1994 to over 350,000 cataracts last year. And what's more, we've been able to really develop a system of sustainability. It's been called compassionate capitalism, where paying patients subsidize the care of the poor. So we do about 40% of the patients will pay, and that pays for the 60% who get free care. And by doing extremely high volume, high quality surgery, we're able to sustain the whole program. The um, global burden of cataract of blindness right now is the sixth leading impediment to the world economy right now. More than a malaria and tuberculosis together. And blindness really perpetuates poverty. And at the same time, the poverty really magnifies the suffering of those who are blind. 
And we've really been able to see this transformation. And Nepal is now the only large poor country that has reversed its rate of blindness. We spread seamlessly into Bhutan, which has had similar success, Tibet, India, Pakistan, and now Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're taking people who are totally blind and not just restoring their sight, but restoring their lives and the lives of their families. And the joy, it's really hard to describe this, this incredible joy, the moment the patches come off and the joy of the family being reunited with the loved ones who can see. And I've now come to Stanford about five years ago. It's really the academic hub of how we're really trying to change global eye care. Stanford really is the global home of uh, eye care training. And we have amazing collaboration here at Stanford. We have the ophthalmology department, led by Dr. Jeff Goldberg, is just fantastic. And we're world leaders in all the subspecialties of ophthalmology. But we also are a hub for innovation and collectively we're working with the business school. And the center is the Buyers Eye Institute. But our spokes out from there, we work with the design school, uh, the ophthalmic uh, innovation fellowships. We have a global ophthalmology fellowship. We have a really close relationship with the Stanford Center for uh, innovation and global health. But we're also working on health policy. How can we spread cost-effective eye care around the world? We're working with the School of Engineering and Business. We're working with trying to develop big data learning and screening and ways that we can reach the poorest of the poor in a more effective and cohesive manner. We are uh, looking at the return on investment and how much returns to the economy. We're doing a big economic study with the Department of Economics here right now, looking at for every dollar spent on cataract surgery in Ghana, how much in the long term is brought back to uh, the society. We're also trying to reverse engineer a lot of what we've been doing in Asia and Africa in terms of high quality, low cost delivery and reaching the poor to provide care for the indigent of our community, for the unhoused of our community, East Palo Alto and the Central Valley. And I hope some of you can sometime come on one of our Stanford outreach trips and see what we're doing globally. And just the joy, I've been doing it for 25 years and still the day when the patches come off, I actually returned yesterday from Tanzania and Malawi. And, and the joy every morning when the patches come off, people who've been blind often for 10, 15 years, children who've never been able to see properly, and then the patches come off and they can see. There's this like moment of hesitation and then this incredible joy. Helen Keller said, just because I can't do everything, I won't refuse to do something I can do. And overcoming needless blindness is something we can do. One step at a time, one eye at a time. Thank you very much. <laughs>